Pastor Joe has been with us for the past two Sundays, and he's going to be preaching again today, um, part three of the sermon series for such a time as this. So if you would just give him a warm round of applause, and you can bring him up here to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. So glad to be with uh, all of you here this morning. Um, obviously, when the, the vote was taken or the survey last week, whether or not to keep the carpet here, um, it looks like the vote was to keep it here, but I didn't know if it'd be here, so I tried to match the carpet the best that I could in case it was. So there you go. So we have stripes on the floor and polka dots on my shirt. So for those of you who are watching uh, right now live on, uh, on, on uh, Facebook, um, we just want to say greetings. Hopefully that's not a distraction. But so glad to be here with you this morning. It just seems like the last three weeks have gone by so fast, um, but it's been really a privilege and an honor to be with you. It was, uh, it was great to just have lunch with you this last week and uh, to just fellowship. And God is on the move, obviously, here at, at uh, Trinity Monterey Park. And uh, we'll continue to pray for you and lift you up. Uh, but right now, um, the Lord has brought us into this place to congregate, to come together to do nothing other than to celebrate Him and His name and come together and give testament of who He is and what He's doing in each of, of our lives. Amen? Amen? Okay, now I'm going to wake you up this morning, so we're going to try that one more time. Amen? Amen? All right, and can I get a witness in the house? Amen? Amen. All right, so now we've kind of warmed up just a little bit, and, uh, and as we jump into this text, I would encourage you to to open up your Bibles and, uh, and let's read along together. I'm going to be sharing from John chapter 4. And actually this last week, I referred to that text when you remember we were talking um, about Mark chapter 2 and we were talking about the stretcher bearers, the, the, the four men and the commitment that they've made to one another. And, and, and for such a time as this, and uh, they picked up that man and they, they, they felt compelled to get that man to Jesus, to the very feet of Jesus, in the very presence of Jesus. And then the week before that, we were in Esther chapter 4 where we were looking at where Mordecai came to Esther and said, um, for such a time as this, you need to act, you need to move, you need to go and be an audience in presence of the king because there's an entire nation of people, the, the chosen people, the promised people of God, um, their lives depend on it. And we talked about that tension that Esther had for the fact that she could lose her life for the sake of others. But last week I mentioned um, John chapter 4. And talking about how I love that one text, that one phrase in there where it says that Jesus had to go into Samaria, into Sychar as He was leaving Judea and He was on His way to Galilee. He had to go. And so this morning I just felt like maybe this, this last week as I had mentioned that and shared that and considering the series that we're having that maybe together we could unpack that text and see what the Lord would have in store for us this morning. So, in John chapter 4, let's look at, uh, let's just start with verse 4. And it says this, Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Jacob, or excuse me, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For you see, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you go and get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? And then it goes on and it says, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst Indeed, the water that I give him, will, it will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. 
Verse 16, Jesus told her, go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, is that you have had five husbands and the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Verse 21, Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are, they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Verse 24, God is spirit and His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Verse 25, the woman said, I, I know that Messiah that called Christ is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. And then in verse 26, then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am He. And then in verse 27, just then His disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Margins in your Bibles, uh, in the books that you have read or are reading um, here current as you study, as you research for things. But margins are those clear, those clear spaces that, that, that create little frameworks along the edge of a page. They are what keeps the words from being fumbled around and falling all over the page. Every book has them. On occasion, you may even choose to jot something down on them, but mostly those margins go unnoticed. Rick McKinley says this, when we pull back the curtain on his life, we discover that Jesus knows what it's like to have society shove you to the side of the page. He goes, he says this, Jesus knows what it's like not to really be accepted and in the end to be totally rejected. Jesus can identify with life in the margins because when God came down to earth in, in the person of Jesus Christ, hear me this morning church, McKinley concludes by saying this, Jesus landed in the margins. And in the society in which we live, we talk often and we hear where people are often marginalized. And our heart aches and breaks. But when we think about it ourselves, we too, when we reflect on our own life and our own journey, oftentimes we feel like we've been kicked into the margins or that that's where we are living from is in the margins, that, that we are marginalized and we often just sometimes just cry out in, in voice or maybe in prayer, but, but God, I don't get this. God, I don't understand this. But don't miss here this morning, if, if just in the few moments that we have, I want you to know that we can take God and we can take Him at His word. That God promises to be with us wherever we are in the midst of the journey. He promises to be with us in our brokenness. He promises to be with us in the midst of our struggles, our trials, our tribulations, and our failures. But He is the one who lands in the middle of our life with us and says that He is willing to walk with us step by step, stride for stride. He wants to see us be victors in Christ. He wants us to see us accept life eternal, the, 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 the hope that His blood cleanses us in our hearts and in our lives, the blood that was shared, uh, shed on the hill called Calvary. Does anybody in the house want to say amen to that? So this morning as we look at this text, I would, I would just encourage you to just take some notes, either some mental notes or just jot some things down that stand out to you. But for such a time as this, John 10.10 10 says this, I have come, that being Christ, I have come that they may have, that you may have, write your own name in there, that, that you, Joe, may have life and have it to the full. Mike Iaconelli, the late Mike Iaconelli, a, a pastor and an author and a, and a well-known speaker, in his book, Messy Spirituality, says that all of the cards are stacked against the woman at the well. 
Looking at her long string of bad choices, many would consider this woman at the well, the woman that met Jesus on that afternoon, they would consider her to be unredeemable, unsalvageable, and unteachable, and beyond help. She hasn't just made a few mistakes. She has made a lifetime of mistakes. There's this rhythm of mistakes, enough to cause most people to conclude that her life is scarred beyond hope. But Scripture tells us that she comes to the well at the middle of the day because respectable women come in the morning. And she knows that she is anything but. But little did she know that on that particular afternoon that her life would change. Little did she know that something great was coming. Maybe you've heard this story before, but there was a woman who she sat in her doctor's office and her doctor came to her and we hear this more and more and it's, it's just tragic, it's heartbreaking, but the doctor came to her and, and said that, uh, that, that your, your cancer is terminal and that you only have a few months in which to live. So she immediately went home and started to get all of her things in order and she called her young pastor to her home and she said, Pastor, the doctor has given me this word, this news, and, and I'm only going to be around for, for a short period of time, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to lead my service. I, I want you to sing these songs. And I want to be buried with my Bible. But there's just one more thing that I want you to promise me, Pastor, that you will follow through with this, this desire that I have, this ask that I have. And he said, okay, well... Well, what is that? And she said, please make sure that you bury me with a fork in my right hand. And he's like, I've never had a requisition like that before. Why would you want, and, and I mean, obviously, his response was great. Why would you want to be buried with a fork in your right hand? She said, you know what, Pastor? She says, I've been a part of this church for years and years and years. And often we would have Church potlucks. You know, Pastor, we, we love pot. What is church without potlucks, right? Gathering together and fellowshipping over food. And she says, what is the, the one thing that ladies often say from back in the kitchen? Make sure that you hold on to your fork because something better is coming. And you know what that means. That, that the dessert is coming, right? Oftentimes, we, we want the dessert before we want the meal, right? We just want to get through the meal to get to the dessert. In other words, what she was saying was, Pastor, when people walk by my casket and they look in and they see me, a body that is no longer present here, but that my life, my heart, my soul is with my Creator, with God, remind them, tell them what the fork represents, that something better is coming. Are you with me here this morning, church? So when we think about this text here this morning, we need to see and understand that, 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 that the woman at the well that day, she had no hope. She had no respect. But Jesus respects her. Why? Because Jesus doesn't see everyone the, the, the way that everybody else sees us. For something, for her, something better was coming. As far as Jesus was concerned, this marginalized woman was salvageable. When I read the text passage where, where Peter told Jesus the night of the Last Supper, I will follow you, Lord, no matter what. As a matter of fact, God, I will die for you. You can, you can look it up. I'm convinced that Peter truly believed what he was saying, yet within just a short few numbers of hours, a, a, a period of time in the same night, saying that to, to God Himself, Peter denied the Christ how many times? Not once, not twice, but how many times? Three times. But listen, church, this morning, how often do we do the same thing? We, we cry out loud, Lord, I will never do this again. Or Lord, if you will just get me out of this mess, I will do this, I will do this. And, and if we were to be honest, how often do we fail at that? Lord, you do your part, and I'll do my part, but we're the ones that are the breach of the contract. We are the ones that break the covenant. 
God has never, just for the record, God has never broken His word. I have come that you may have life. I have come to give my life so that you could have life eternal. He didn't bail out at the end. He didn't say, I want to take a rain check on this whole thing. God did and continues to do what He says. Does anybody want to give witness to that here this morning? So when I read this text, you can just imagine how, how Peter must have felt in, in that hour of the Lord's greatest need. Peter bails on him. There may be somebody here this morning that, that feels like you have blown it in such a way so bad that, that the Lord won't even give any attention to you because you, you've just been so bad. But hold on, church. Hold on. Are, are you ready? Because something better is coming. Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, says, and I quote, those judged undesirable by everyone else are infinitely desirable to God. And when one of them turns to God, a party breaks out. He says, we're all oddballs, but God loves us anyhow. Would you turn to your neighbor right now, left to right, and say, you're, you're an oddball. Just say that. <laughs> oh, I love that. But listen to this. Now tell them. You may, we, we may be oddballs, but God loves us anyhow. Okay? All right. But listen, when it came to Peter, what Jesus saw was not a man who blew it, but a man to whom later in Scripture promises to build his church. You can look it up. Matthew 16, verse 17 through 18, where it says, Peter, you are a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Whew, I don't know about you, but I'm getting pretty excited about the message here this morning. God is an awesome God, and God has it all under control. God has got it. I can just see Peter now after he's blown it. I could just see him where he sits down and he starts to write out his resignation letter. And maybe it sounds something like this. Dear, dear rabbi, dear teacher, dear friend, old buddy, I, I know I have the biggest mouth. And I'm sure that you know this by now. I, 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 I just take off and I'm, I'm just very impulsive. I easily lose focus. Remember that whole boat walking on the water thing? I know that I brought great embarrassment to you. But we, but listen, listen to this. But, but Jesus, Jesus, I know that, that you are the way. But I'm sorry that I've blown it. And I think that if Jesus was to receive a resignation letter like that, I think that he wouldn't accept it. Amen, church? How often have we come to the Lord and said, Lord, I had messed up and I've blown it. And we felt so discouraged. And we felt like maybe we could even walk through the threshold of the church. And Jesus came and said, I have come that you may have hope, that you may have life eternal. I hope that somebody hears that this morning because maybe that's the only thing that you need to hear out of all that is said, that you have hope in Christ. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 6 says this, I'll put muscle into the people of Judah. I'll save the people of Joseph. I know their pain and I will, I will make them good as new. They'll get a fresh start as if, as if nothing has ever happened. And why? Because I am their very own God. I will make them strong. I will make them God strong. And they will live my way. Why? Because I, God, say so. In John chapter 21, verse 15, Jesus said to Peter, Do you truly love me? Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And then the response was, Then feed my sheep. John 21, 16, Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep. John 21, verse 17, Simon, do you love me? It says that Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him how many times? He asked him how many times did he love him? Three times. Peter denied him three times. Then Jesus asked him, how many times do you love me? How many times do you love me, Peter? I love you three times. I, I love you, Lord, every time that you ask. Then Jesus said, then feed my sheep. See, Jesus isn't at all afraid to think about what others think. What he's concerned about is you and me and our stuff. Can I get an amen? amen. 
McKinley says, and I quote, in his crazy purposes and plans, he comes to the scandalous margin of society in order to identify with those of us who live in those places. See, Jesus didn't come to rise up as some superhero. No. He does this because He's on mission. And church, Jesus is in the margins of life today to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom for those who are held captive. Chuck Swindoll says, and I quote in his book simply titled Jesus, that Jesus was fully human, that He knows what it's like to be tempted, He knows what it's like to be hurt, He knows what it's like to to need guidance, and, and He knows what the future holds. He wants to teach you how to live for Him even as you face the difficulties of life on this earth. And then He encourages the reader to come and sit down at the feet of Jesus and simply listen. That text, be still and know that I am God. In the midst of all of the the craziness and the chaos and the the noise that, that happens in our lives every single day, God simply says, come and be still and know that I am God, that I am God, your God. Listen, Christ didn't pull the plug on this world when, when those that were close to Him fled in fear from the city. He didn't give up on those that He had trained for three years when they blew it. Would you, this morning, as we think about this, just reflect in your own life how God hasn't abandoned you. God is willing to draw closer to you than a brother, but you just simply have to ask, God, will you come into my life? God, can we do this thing called life together? Can we do it in tandem? He is so willing to do that. Jesus knew difficulties. He knew betrayal. He knew abuse. He knew rejection. He he, he knew hatred. He knew injustice. Friend, today the the Lord, the the Yahweh, the the El Rohai, which means the God who who sees, the Lord who is our shepherd wants to teach you how to live in the midst of brokenness and life for such a time as this. For such a time as this. He wants to embrace you. He wants to hold you. He softly wants to speak these words to you. You are my beloved. You are not alone. Psalm 23, verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, God, are with me. So look at verse 10 in our text, if you have it in front of you this morning. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, would you have asked him and would he have given you he would have given you living water? Have you ever felt like Christ in a very simple way just asked you to, to do some certain things? Where the Lord just impressed upon you to, to just do some certain things, maybe some simple things, but he's asking you to be a part. And I don't think that that's bad. Matter of fact, I think that that's awesome. And as I look through Scripture time and time again, oftentimes when Jesus would be traveling down the road and and there would be a leper or there would be somebody who who was alongside the road, a paralytic or somebody who who, who had been lame or blind for, for all of their life or for an extended period of time, one of the things that Jesus would do is He would come to them, He would show them love and compassion. I'm sure even in the tone of His voice was something that was receptive, but He'd say, what is it that you want me to do for you? Sometimes we wake up in the morning and we just let life do us. But what if we really got up in the morning and we were intentional in saying, okay, these are the things that I need to accomplish. These are the things that God wants me to do. What what is it that God wants me to do? And God, these would be great things if you could just work in my life as well. When we extend conversation, great things happen. But the enemy would love us to feel isolated and Think, have us think that we have to figure it out all on our own. Uh, there's one thing to come to the Lord and say, Lord, this is all of the baggage. This is all of the stuff that I have going on in my life. And we come and we lay them at the feet of Jesus. 
We say, Jesus, I can't take it anymore. Lord, I, I just need help. This is too much of a burden. Isn't that what we're instructed to do in Scripture? Yes, that's biblical. But this is where we do something bad in our own lives. But when we get done praying those prayers, sometimes we pick up what we just laid at the altar. We pick it back up. So it should be like this. God, I lay it at your feet. And palms down, we walk away and we give praise and glory to God and just trust and believe in faith that He's going to do things according to His purposes and plans. But sometimes we turn around and we pick it all back up again and we walk right back out the door. Is there anybody with me this morning? Are you tracking with me this morning? And so when we look at this text here today, Verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and, and what it is that, that you asked for a drink or who it is you asked for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Oftentimes when Jesus was healing somebody, he would stand in there with this audience of people. It wasn't because he was trying to, to gain momentum as far as popularity, but he was there intentionally to make a difference and to make an impact. In John chapter 4, he had to go through Samaria down to Sychar. Why? Because there was going to be a woman that was going to be found there. Her life was broken. It was a mess, complete chaos, and he was going to turn it all around. See, the woman at the well needed to know who God is, she needed to know the gift of God and then ask Him for it. Look at verse 15 quickly. The woman said to Him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to, to draw water. Church, please get this. The Lord didn't get frustrated with her when she didn't get it. She wanted to, to, to end the labor intensive. I don't want to come here every day. It's, it's, it, the well is deep and it's hard to draw the water. Not only that, but the humiliation of, of people that I see, other people that are drawing water from the well. Lord, just fix this thing for me now and I won't have to worry about that anymore. She was talking about the physical. He was talking about the spiritual. Please get this. Jesus said he was the living water. All she could get from that was that she had her own spring. And she was tired of getting thirsty. She didn't want to work so hard. But Jesus reaches out to the woman in the margins of life. Because she was not able to immediately understand, Jesus does not get frustrated with her, but Jesus then deals with her most basic need, the need to address the sin in her life. And oh, by the way, a little side note, I won't charge you for this. But as I was looking at this text, I don't think that Jesus ever got his drink. Okay? I don't think he did. And I don't think that he was worried about it. He had to go, but I don't think that he ever got his drink. I just, I looked for it. I've looked for it, you know, for years. And I've never found that in there where he, he got his drink. But look at verse 16. Jesus addresses her need when he tells her to go and call her husband. Don't miss this. I mention this because this indicates to us the readers, that Jesus knows everything about her. The Lord knows everything about you and as me as well. There's a slide up uh, behind me, I believe, and it's Romans 8, verses 27 through 28. Meanwhile, the moment that we get tired in waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside helping us. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. He knows our pregnant condition, and He keeps us present before God. And that's why we can be so sure that in every detail in our lives, the lives of love for God is worked into something good. Anybody in the house just want to say thank, say thank you, Jesus? Jesus is, with this short requisition, shows this woman that he knows more about her than just her social status. He knows her stuff. Church, he knows our stuff. He knows of her marital status in her life of sin. Look at verse 17. She acknowledges that she has no husband, but she tries to divert the conversation to something else. And that's what we tend to do sometimes in our own lives. God starts to hone in. And starts to, to, to work through some of those issues and things in our lives. And we, we try to divert the conversation. We, we try to divert the, the situation. We simply just don't want to deal with it. 
when we are faced with the truth, we don't like it and we try to pack it up and we, we try to take off and hide. 1 Samuel 22 tells of a time when, when David was in trouble and he, he fled the city and, and he went out and he hid in a cave, a cave called Adullam. John Ortberg suggests, and I quote, the cave is where you end up with your props, your supports, your, your crutches, and, and all of that. All of that stuff gets stripped away. He adds, the cave is where you find yourself when you thought you were going to do great things, have a great family, or boldly go where no man has gone before, and it becomes clear that, the, that things will not work out as you have dreamed. What's hard about hiding out is that you begin to wonder you begin, as you're hiding, you begin to wonder if the Lord even knows where you are. You, you wonder if you have somehow fallen off of His radar. For Samuel 22, I love this text. So David got away, he escaped to the cave. When his brothers and others associated with his family heard where he was, they came down and joined him. And I just want to pause for just a second and say, to kind of build into this text, but you need to understand, when David took off and he fled, he went to the cave. He was hiding. He was fearful for his life. And I'm sure there were times when he cried out to God because oftentimes we see in the, in the Psalms where David cried out, God, where are you? God, I feel like I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm in a parched desert. Lord, yes, I've made mistakes, but Lord, I was so for you. Lord, you, you've even said I'm after your own heart. David's in this cave and he has to be asking all of these questions. Just let me share with you a little bit of this story. But as David is hiding in the cave, way up on the hillside, if you were to study it, it'd take a lot to get to a cave to get to somebody. And all of a sudden, David, as he's conversing with, with the Lord, saying, Lord, where are you? He started to hear the rocks kind of shuffle and fumble a little bit. And all of a sudden, he started seeing images come into the cave and make their way down to where he was. And it tells us that David's family, that some of David's friends, people, men that would later become David's mighty warriors when, when God would give him the throne. But text tells us that in the midst of his crying out to God in his midst of feeling lonely that God sent over 400 people to that cave to tell David, God knows that you are here. God still has a plan. Nothing has been broken. The plans of man are thwarted, but God is on the throne. God is in control. You need to trust and believe you are God's anointed. And this morning, you need to hear this, church family. But in Psalm 139, you, each and every one of you, are God's masterpiece. He is here to protect His masterpiece. To hold His masterpiece. Why? Because you are all beautiful. There are times in our life where we just need to come clean. We need to, to clean up our past. We need to let go of the stuff that, that creates separation between us and Christ. You, you need to acknowledge what it is in your life that still hurts or, or maybe what you are ashamed of. So this morning, if you're, if you're taking notes, just write these down. Just two simple notes this morning. And there's a slide up there. But one, you just need to be honest with yourself. For such a time as this, you need to be honest with yourself with where you are in your journey of life. Be honest about your pain, about your fear, about your anger, about your bitterness, about your resentment over what people have done to you, about the way that you have felt abused or abandoned, ridiculed, or the shame that you feel. This is definitely a bit personal, but, but it is necessary because your brokenness will do nothing for you but keep you on a downward spiral and it will keep you living in the past without hope for a future. None of us here are without some sense of, of brokenness. There's something in each of our lives that, that causes us to take residence somewhere out there on the side of the page, out there in the margins of life. As far as Jesus was concerned, the woman that had been labeled one with, with no future had a future. The woman with the string of failures was about to have all of those strings broken. Are you with me still? We have just a few more minutes. As far as Jesus was concerned, there was hope about ready to take place on that afternoon. When she went to the well to draw water for her human existence like she did every day, that afternoon the Father God, Jesus Christ, Abba, Daddy, God, 
was there to meet her spiritual needs and to produce and to provide for her living water. Maybe this morning this is the perfect time for you to draw close and draw from the living well. We've all made mistakes. We all have remorse. We all have things that that we wish we could go back and fix. We have often said, I wish that I could just have that moment back. I wish that I could just take that moment back and, 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 and turn that decision around. If we could just change that in an instant. If we could just have that situation to, to do it over again, we wouldn't ever have to experience this guilt. But listen to this church this morning. We can't, and so we feel guilty about it, and so we carry it around. But if we can be honest with ourselves, we can admit our brokenness, we can pour our hearts out before the Lord and know that He hears us and know that we can give that to Him and know that He will receive it and He will work. He can work all things out to the glory of His good. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real, a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Iaconelli says, Our search for love, for meaning, for happiness is often a search for God in disguise. When the bottom falls out on our lives, when we, become, when we come to a dead end, when there is no place to go, we often get in touch with our longings for God. And he continues by saying this, religion has told the Samaritan woman about the possibility of a, of a, of a Messiah. Yet she, she sees and she meets the real Messiah face to face who immediately recognizes her thirst and offers her the, the living water of His grace. Revelation 21.6 We know the end of the story, right? Because we... We can flip to the very last book, the, the last few chapters of the Bible, and, and, and Jesus tells us, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, to him who is thirsty, to him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of life. That afternoon, the woman saw, she saw how the world looked at her and also heard as the, the very one who calls himself the great I am, the great Jehovah God. She heard from her comforter, the mighty fortress, the, the one who establishes eternal life. She also heard from the lips of her creator that she is beloved and that she is cared for. The old hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Secondly, and we're almost done here this morning, secondly, not only do you have to be honest with yourself, but you have to be honest with God. If God knows everything about us, I can't think of anything that would be more freeing And to say, Lord, take this burden from me today. Lord, you know what's in my closet, or you know what's, what's going on in my life, or you know what I've been dealing with. Lord, would you take it and just be honest with him? He is the chain breaker. He is the, the giver of life. But we need to be honest with Him because if we're not honest with ourselves and we're not honest with God, then we're holding it on to ourselves and the enemy says, I, I, I've got this person right where I want him. They're not going to do anything for God because they don't feel like, like they're, they're of any worth. And God says, but you are my masterpiece. The enemy says that you have broken things so bad that, that there's no way. But God is a God that can take and create a beautiful mosaic out of all the things of our life. Who are we to say that God can't take our life and all of the stuff and do something incredible, something awesome with it? We are all broken vessels. But God is willing to use us. You've got to be honest with God. Tell God how you feel. Get it out. You, 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 if you have a question, ask Him. God can handle it. Somebody said, and I quote, God already knows you're hurt because He saw it when you were hurt. And He hurt with you and He grieved with you. 
It's not going to be a surprise to God when you're honest to Him about the pain in your life and the shame in your life. He already knows. He already cares. He already loves you. He just wants you to be honest with Him. And if we allow this stuff that, that we have in our lives, if we just allow it to continue on, it will eat at the very fabric of who we are. Sometimes we try to hide it and maybe we actually get, even get away with it for a while, but, but somebody called that or calls that depravative management. We all have stuff going on. But don't just rationalize it because rationalizing is, is telling us in our mind that everything's okay or that we've got it figured out or we compartmentalize it. We can rationalize all that we want and, all, and, and say it's, it's okay because everyone else is doing it and, or maybe it happened a long time ago. But listen, if it was wrong, it was wrong. If it was broken covenant, broken relationship with God, let's just call it what it is. But let's seek restoration. Rejuvenation, hope, new life. It's the only way that we can break those chains that bind us. Otherwise, the energy flowing out of us is not divine water. It becomes just natural sewage, if you will. And it's, and it's swaying with the proud and terrified of, of a soul that's determined to prove itself, to exercise enough to, to control life, to make it work so that people around us accept us and whatever that might mean. But quickly, check this out. Look at verse 28, 29. The woman went back to town after she experienced this with God at the afternoon, that conversation with Christ and testified that she was free from all of the stuff that she had carried for so long. Come and see the one who told me all that I ever did. In other words, you've talked about me. And I've even shamed myself. But something freeing happened to me at the well today. Church, when the Lord helps us to break that bondage, there is nothing, nothing that the enemy can do to keep us from sharing the good news, the faithfulness of God. I was in Starbucks a, 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 about eight or nine months ago. And if you've ever been in Starbucks, I don't go very often, but if you ever go, um, you, you'll kind of know what I'm, what I'm saying here. But often there's a, a great like crowd, a, lot, a long line to get coffee, okay? And so there's a lot of people standing in line to get coffee on this morning. And this lady standing in line and it was a Monday morning, I do remember, because it followed a Sunday, obviously. And I guess that she came to know the Lord as her personal Lord and Savior. And I'm going to tell you, everybody in Starbucks heard about how she gave her heart and her life, and she had a new sense of hope in her life. Everybody in Starbucks heard it. And I think about how when, when in our lives, when we first came to know Christ, think about that fire that just burned like, <clears throat> down in your belly. Yeah. This is awesome. This is freeing. This is exciting. You just want to tell everybody, right? That's why we come together and we congregate. We come together every week to share the good news that God and the great things that God is doing in each of our lives. That's why we gather together, to keep the fire going. And sometimes we feel like our fire is about ready to go out and somebody comes along. The Lord sends somebody along and they come alongside and they say, we're going to do this thing together. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we need to do life together. We need to fan the flame. So we need to be honest with ourselves and we need to be honest with God. I think that this woman, I think that her words gain much attention could it be that, that somebody heard or someone heard her sharing that day and they too wanted to drink from the eternal life, the, the eternal spring? Okay, so let's get this straight. If Jesus knows all about her and her past, then surely He knows all about ours. And there's that word, ouch. But what are we going to do? What are we going to choose to do with that today? And in closing, Charles H. Spurgeon, one of the the greatest known theologians says this, He, God, is still able to bless since He has this living water only from His unchanging self. He therefore has it now as fully as ever. And it goes on, He needs nothing from us. He Himself is the sole fountain, full and all-sufficient forever. So we need not fear exhausting His fullness at all times we may come to Him 
and we need never fear that He will deny us or turn us away. Psalm 36, 9, it is not a cistern, a mere cistern to hold. It's a pouring, running, life-giving, living stream. For such a time as this, this is the Word of God. Thank you so much. Be blessed, my church family. God is good.